Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be in Romans. Spend a lot of time in Romans this morning. We're going to begin in chapter 8. If you haven't been here, we're talking about the way things work in the world. Those universal and timeless laws that apply to everybody and everything, everywhere, all the time. The reason we're doing this is if you know the way things work, you can thrive. However, if you don't understand the way things work, you can really make a mess. Early in our marriage, Catherine and I were trying to save every penny we possibly could. So when the alternator on my car went out, I was looking for the cheapest solution possible. And um, after I talked to a few folks and I looked under the hood of my car, and saw the alternator practically on top of the engine, I convinced myself, I can do this. This is no problem. A few bolts, a few screws, screws, it's done. So one Saturday, now I'm not, I am not mechanically inclined. My wife will tell you that. But uh, one Saturday, I went out and I bought a new alternator for my car. I got out my tools, most of which had never been used before. And I set out, to replace the alternator in my car. The problem was, I didn't understand how an electrical system in a car works. I didn't understand, for example, that when you replace an alternator in a car, it's a really good idea to disconnect the battery first. <laughs> so, when I took the wires off the alternator and laid them aside, I saw two things. I saw sparks. And then I saw smoke billowing from the bottom of my car. It's when I saw the smoke that I thought to myself, perhaps I've done something wrong. <laughs> so, so after a frantic call to my father and uh, sure enough, I confirmed I had blown out all the fusible links underneath my car. I had made what looked like such a simple thing into a mess simply because I didn't understand the way things worked. Folks, listen, in life, if you don't understand the way things work, you can make a mess before you know it. We can make such a mess in life when we don't understand how life works. Now, the good news is that God in the Bible has told us how life works works. And one of the ways he does this is by giving us laws, timeless, universal truths that apply to everyone, everything, everywhere, all the time. For example, he, we've talked about these the last several weeks. The Bible teaches the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. That's simply the way things work. We looked at the law of marriage. Want a great marriage? The Bible gives us laws for how to make that happen. Uh, we talked about the law of leadership. Want to be an effective leader? The Bible gives us laws for how that works. Today, we look at another law that we find on the page, pages of Scripture. We'll begin reading Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This morning, I want to talk to you about the law of sin and death. And the crowd goes wild. Because that's, that's, what everybody, that's what everybody signed up for this morning. This is one of those sermon topics you don't put on the marquee to get people to come to church. No, it's not a popular topic. I understand that. Uh, let me share with you, just to tee this up. Tommy Nelson used to tell a story about a gentleman who went to a, an isolated village, an isolated community of people who lived beside a river. And this guest showed up in the village and was in, being shown around and dinner time was approaching. So their custom in this village was that the entire village had dinner together on a long table out by the river. 
So they made their way out to the dinner table and uh, the guest took his seat and they began enjoying a wonderful meal together. In the middle of the meal, a crocodile crawls out of the river and mauls a man sitting on the other side of the table from where the guest was sitting. And the, the alligator attacked him ferociously, ripped his arm off, and then crawled back into the river. And then the people sitting around the guy just got up, took the guy to get medical attention, while everyone else around the table acted as if nothing had happened. So obviously the guest spoke up. Didn't you see what just happened? A crocodile came up and mauled a man down there and y'all are acting as if you didn't even see it. That's when one of the leaders of the community spoke up. He said, yes, that happens quite often around here. But you see, in our culture, it's impolite to talk about crocodiles. And the guests began to look around the table and sure enough, he saw people who had been maimed by crocodile attacks, missing arms, missing legs. He spoke to a few people near him that described how they had lost loved ones because of a crocodile attack. And yet, because it's impolite in their culture to talk about crocodiles, nothing was ever done about it. And the attacks continued. I recognize sin is not a popular topic in our world today. I get that. It's not polite to talk about sin. But if we are silent, people will continue to be maimed and destroyed by the crocodile called sin. The Bible gives us laws that teach us how sin works so that we don't have to be maimed or destroyed by it. The law of sin and death. Now, before we get too far into this, I do want to just stop long enough to define the word for you. When the Bible uses the word sin, what does that mean? The word sin comes from the word hamartia, which literally translated means to miss the mark. It's as if you're aiming for something and you miss what you're aiming for. Picture an archer shooting an arrow at a bullseye. If that archer missed the bullseye, that's a sin. He did not hit what he was aiming for. Now, here's what I want you to notice about this definition. The reason I want to point this out is that sin that the Bible describes infers a standard of right and wrong. For there to be a mark, no, for you to miss the mark, there must first be a mark to miss. There is a standard that when we miss that standard, we sin. So the obvious question then is, so what's the standard? What, what does the bullseye look like that we should be aiming for? First John chapter three, verse four. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Now, what law is John talking about here? He's talking about God's law. Sin means to miss God's bullseye for right living. To sin means doing things that God condemns and not doing things God commands. Now, let me just clarify this in a cultural context. Let me just clarify what this means. This standard of right and wrong means that right and wrong is not a matter of opinion. It doesn't matter what you think right and wrong is. What matters is what God's law says about right and wrong. If you're a student of the Bible, you know that in the Old Testament, there's a phrase that recurs over and over and over again. God would condemn a person or a group of people because they did what was right in their own eyes. What does that mean? They did what they thought was right. They followed their own ideas about what was right instead of what God had said was right. So 
The standard of right and wrong is not based on opinion or belief. Secondly, the standard of right and wrong is not based on your preferences. That there may be some things that you wish were right and that you wish were wrong. Our wishing those things is not enough to make it so. Right and wrong is determined. The bullseye is set. It's God's law. It matters what God has to say about it. Thirdly, the standard of right and wrong is not based on what the majority thinks. Uh, you can be right and be in the minority. Uh, we're a voting, we're a voting bunch. We live in a country where we vote. So in a few weeks, in fact, we're all going to be voting. And when you go to the ballot this year, there are going to be some issues on the ballot that are moral in nature. There are, there are going to be moral issues on the ballot, not only here in the state of Georgia, but in states all over the country. For example, uh, you're going to vote on gambling. If you live in Georgia, you're going to vote in ga on gambling. Should we allow that? Should we not allow that? Uh, in some states, you're going to vote on abortion. Should ab abortion be okay or should abortion be illegal? Whatever. Okay. If the majority says that, for example, abortion is okay, that does not make it right because the Bible, God has clearly spoken on this. God knit us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. We are image bearers of our creator from conception. So if the majority votes that abortion is okay, it's still wrong because God has already spoken on that matter. So sin, sin is missing. If y'all want to applaud, you can. I know y'all are just itching. Yeah. So sin is missing God's standard of right and wrong. When we sin, when we miss the bullseye, that means we have not done what God has commanded of us and we have done what God has condemned. So now I want you to listen to what the Bible says about this law of sin and death that the apostle Paul wrote about in Romans chapter eight. In Romans chapter six, verse 23, he says this, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Okay, the first part of this law is that sin leads to death. Folks, it's simply the way things work. You cannot, and I cannot, we, we cannot live in violation of God's standard of right and wrong and live. Sin always leads to death. Now this works in two ways. Sometimes sins lead, sin leads to death in the temporal. In other words, sin will cost you in this life. You will suffer the consequences of sin in this life. Now, let me tell you what you already know. Our adversary, Satan, he wants your demise. Satan wants to destroy you. Why is that, Pastor Jeff? Because you are created in God's image. And Satan fights against all that God is and all that God has created. You, as an image bearer of God, have an enemy. His name is Satan, and he wants to destroy you. Now, here's what you need to know about Satan, the enemy. He's deceptive. He's really good at selling sin. Satan has a way of making sin look so amazing, so appealing, so exciting, so thrilling. Sin, Satan will tell you, is a blast, but sin's a blast that doesn't last. Sin's a blast until it costs you your health. Sin's a blast until it costs you your job. Sin's a blast until it costs you your family. Sin's just awesome until it costs you your integrity and reputation. Sin's a thrilling ride until it enslaves you, causing you to do whatever it takes to get the next hit or the next high. Sin's great 
until you hear the prison door slamming behind you. You see, no matter how Satan disguises it, sin always leads to death, oftentimes in the here and now. But the Bible also very clearly teaches that sin leads to death in eternity, in eternity. In our sermon text this morning, Paul wrote, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That statement begs the question, well, what about those who are not in Christ Jesus? What about them? This statement obviously excludes a group of people. What happens to them? The Bible teaches that God will condemn those who are not in Christ Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, that doesn't sound like the God I worship. I mean, the God I worship would never do something like that to someone. Okay, just as gently as I can tell you, if that's you, the God you worship is a God of your own making. He is not the God the Bible describes. The Bible describes that God is love. He is love. But, he all, but the Bible also describes how God is just. And as a just and loving God, God absolutely must judge sin. He must execute justice. In fact, in a very real way, he executes justice because he loves Let's say, let's say you're at home one evening and your entire family's there and y'all go to bed and in the middle of the night, you hear an intruder breaking into your house and it becomes very clear to you quickly that that intruder means to harm or even kill your family. Okay, if you're a normal person, you're going to do whatever it takes to stop that intruder. Even if it means using deadly force, you're going to stop that intruder. And you'll do so not because you're not loving. You'll do so because you are loving. You love your family so much that you will protect, it from, protect them from anything that would seek to cause them harm. Sin threatens God's creation. So a loving God will in fact destroy anything and everything that threatens what he loves. Now there's a second part of this law. Romans chapter three, verse 23. Many of you know this verse. All have sinned. All of us have missed the bullseye. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the second part of this law that's important to understand is this. Sin's universal. Sin is universal. Sin is not something that just bad people do. Sin is also something that good people do. Okay, let me, let's do a little self-introspection here. I think all of you, if you were honest with yourself, you would conclude, I have a hard time being as good as I want to be. I have a hard time being as good as I want to be. Okay, the Apostle Paul said those exact, almost those exact words. Let me read to you what he wrote in Romans chapter 7. I have the desire, Paul says, the, who wrote most, much of the New Testament. I have the desire, Paul says, to do what is good. But I can't carry it out. For I do not, I do, not do the good I want to do. But the evil that I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. It's the sin living in me that does it. What's Paul saying here? Paul's saying as hard as I try and as much as I want to, I can't be as good as I want to be. And I think every single one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, would say the exact same things. Okay, here's what I want you to see. 
If you can't meet your standard for goodness, you certainly can't meet God's. Because God requires perfection. Now, I know, I, I get it. I know we live in a world where there is virtue in affirmation. You know, the only thing that, well, one of the things that's most morally wrong is to ascribe moral deficiency to someone. Uh, people say, look, you should never let anyone suggest to you that there's anything wrong with the way you are or that there's something wrong with who you are. And I get that, I understand. But the Bible says the opposite thing. The Bible says there is something very wrong with all of us. We have all sinned, we have all missed that target. And when we miss that target, that means we, that leads to death. That means that we are all not only sinful, that means we all carry a deadly disease. The law of sin and death, you see, describes how we all suffer from a deadly disease called sin. But fortunately, the law of sin and death doesn't end there because the Bible also teaches sin has a solution. Just because we all sin and sin leads to death doesn't mean we all have to die. The Bible describes one single cure, and there's only one. Let me go back to our sermon text and continue reading. Romans 8, starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now watch this, to be a sin offering. We'll come back to that. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Okay, what's Paul saying here? Sin's solution has to do with the fact that Jesus became, in Paul's words, became our sin offering. What does that mean? That means Jesus paid for your sin and mine so that you wouldn't have to. Sin, you see, always leads to death. Remember, sin leads to death. So... Jesus took our death for us. Jesus literally died your death when he died on the cross. But Jesus did more than that. Jesus didn't just pay for our sin to take our sins away. He did more than that. And Paul alluded to it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus died and rose again, he offered to take your sins away. That makes you neutral. But he did, he did more than that. He offers you his righteousness. He subtracts our sin, he adds his righteousness. Now here's what that means. If you are in Christ, if you're in Christ, when God looks at you, he no longer sees you. He sees you through Jesus. He does not see your righteousness. He does not see my righteousness. He sees Jesus' righteousness. So that is sin's solution. Jesus paid our sin debt. He died our death. And he imparted to us his own righteousness so that we can, in fact, in God's eyes, meet his standard. But I want to close with a very important observation about sin's solution. It's not yours by default. Some of the passages of Scripture, in fact, some of the passages in Romans that talk about being in Christ and being rescued from our sin, 
and the death that it brings. They all use a very important word. It's a small word, little word, two letters. But boy, what a difference it makes. The word is if. I F. Let me give you an example. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. What's the first word of that verse? If. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You see, Jesus offers to die your death, but that is a gift that you must receive. I'll close with this final story. Back in the 1830s, there lived a man named George Wilson. In fact, if you've had a government class or U.S. history class, perhaps you've read, you remember reading about George Wilson. George Wilson was sentenced to death. He received the death penalty. He was sentenced to death by hanging because he had robbed the U.S. Postal Service. And in the process of that robbery, he threatened the life of a postal worker. So the court sentenced him to death by hanging. Well, it just so happens that George Wilson had some pretty powerful friends. In fact, friends so powerful, they knew the President of the United States personally. His name was Andrew Jackson, President Jackson. And uh, his friends intervened on his behalf. And to make a long story short, President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon for George Wilson. He pardoned him of the crime. But that's where things got interesting. When the president issued the pardon, George Wilson decided to refuse it. He refused to accept pardon from death. He chose instead death itself. Now, the courts didn't know what to do with that. Who do we listen to? Do we listen to the president of the United States or do we listen to the man whose life hangs in the balance here? So they took this to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had to rule on what would happen to George Wilson. And I want to read to you what they wrote. Quote, a pardon, the Supreme Court says, a pardon is a piece of paper, the value of which depends on its acceptance by the person implicated. It's hardly to be supposed that one under sentence of death would refuse to accept a pardon. But if it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged, end quote. George Wilson rejected his pardon, choosing death over life. Now, lest you think that is shocking, people today do it all the time. God extends pardon to us. All you have to do is call upon Jesus' name and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead and you'll be saved from the death that all sin leads to. And yet so many today say, no, I'm good. I'll do it on my own. I wonder if there may be people listening to me either here in this room or watching online and you have never accepted God's gift of pardon. The wonderful news of the gospel is it's offered to you right now. I'd like everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we look into our own hearts, consider our own lives. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never received God's offer of forgiveness, I would encourage you to pray to him right now from your heart. You might say, God, I know that I've sinned. I've missed the mark. But I believe Jesus, your son, died and rose again so that my sins could be forgiven. And I'm placing all my trust right now in what Jesus has done for me. 
to rescue me from my sin and the death it brings and to make everything right between you and me. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone looking back up here, if that was your heartfelt prayer this morning, or you'd like to know more about how you can receive God's forgiveness, we have some literature that we'd love to give you uh, this morning before you leave. It's available back in our grand foyer. It's over at guest services. It's free. There's no charge for it. We just want you to have it because we want you to understand how God's forgiveness works. Uh, go by after the service is over. Say, Pastor Jeff mentioned some literature. May I have a copy? And they'll give it to you and you can be on your way. If you're watching online and you prayed along with me just now, I'd love to be able to share with you the same literature that we're handing out physically here this morning. The way I can get it to you, we've set up a website called imadeadecision.com. imadeadecision.com. If you go there, you'll find the place where you can send us your mailing address. And if you do that, I'll put in the mail to your home this week what we're handing out to the new believers here this morning. Please, I hope you'll take a moment to do that.